So we are going to prove that every bijective function has a two-sided inverse. To do that, let's suppose we have some function f, which takes inputs from the domain x and gives us outputs from the codomain y. If we have some element little y of this codomain, we can define the preimage f to the negative 1 of y as the set of all inputs from that domain x such that f of x equals y. So these are all of the inputs that get mapped to this specific element y under the function f. Now we say that a function is bijective if it is both injective and surjective. So let's go through each of those individually. We say that a function is surjective if for every output y in the codomain there exists some input x from the domain such that f of x equals y. So for every output in the codomain, there's at least one element of the domain that maps to it under the function f. Now we can say this in different words using the idea of a preimage, because this f of x equals y is exactly the condition that we need on x for it to be in the preimage of y. So this statement right here, f of x equals y, is the same thing as x is in the preimage of y. So for every output in the codomain, there's at least one element of the preimage. So we could write that as the size of the set f inverse of y, the preimage of that element y, is greater than or equal to 1 because this is the set of all inputs that map to y, and we know there's at least one input. So the size of this set is greater than or equal to one. So now we know that a function being surjective is the same as saying that for every output in the codomain, the preimage of that output has at least one element. There's at least one input that maps to that output. So now let's look at functions being injective. The definition of a function being injective is that if f of a equals f of b, that always implies a equals b. Now let's think about how we can write this in terms of pre-images. Well, let's say we have some element y of the codomain, and we want to look at the preimage f inverse of y. Now by definition, the preimage is the set of all inputs from that domain that map to y. So let's say we have two different inputs, a and b, that are in the preimage of y. Well, by definition, an input is only going to be in the preimage if f of that input equals y. So if a is in the preimage of y, that's the same thing as saying that f of a equals y. And if b is in the preimage, that's the same thing as saying that f of b equals y. But because these two both equal y, we now have f of a equals f of b. And because our function is injective, that means a equals b. So we've just proved that if a and b are in the preimage of y, then a equals b. So we can't have two different elements in the preimage, because any time we have two elements, they're always the same. So the preimage, this set right here, can have at most one element. It can never have two distinct elements because any two elements are always equal. So we can write that the size of that set, the preimage of y, is less than or equal to one. This preimage has at most one element if f is injective. So now we know that a function being injective is the same as saying that for every output in the codomain, the preimage has at most one element. There's at most one input that maps to y. So now what happens if we look at a function that's bijective? Well, we said by definition, a function is bijective if it's injective and surjective. So this means that the preimage, f inverse of y, for each element of the codomain, well, we know that this is greater than or equal to one because the function is surjective. And it's also less than or equal to 1 because the function is injective. So the only way both of these are true at the same time is if the size of the preimage equals 1. So for each element y of the codomain, there is exactly one input 
that maps to it. Remember that this pre-image f inverse of y is a set. It's the set of all inputs that map to y. So if this pre-image is a set that has exactly one element, then we can write it as a set as something called a singleton, which is where we have a set with just one thing in it. So for each output in the codomain, we can write the pre-image as the set containing one input x. Now, given that we have this pre-image, this one input from the domain for each output in the codomain, we can use this to define a function, f inverse from y to x. And the way we define our inverse function is by saying that f inverse of y is just going to be that element of the pre-image. So because each pre-image has one element, we can say take f inverse of y to be the thing in the pre-image set, that one element. It turns out that f inverse, if we define it this way, is a two-sided inverse to the function f. So let's look at why. So in order for this f inverse to be a two-sided inverse of f, we need it to be a left inverse and a right inverse. So in order for this to be a right inverse, we want f of f inverse of y to equal y. But what exactly is f inverse of y? Well, we said that this was the element of the pre-image of y. But the pre-image of y only contains elements x that map to y under the function f. So whatever this is, it's something in the pre-image, and by definition, that means that f maps this to y. So we know that f of f inverse of y equals y because that's the definition of the pre-image. We also need f to be a left inverse. In order to do that, we need to consider what is f inverse of f of x for some x in the domain. Well, this is the one element of the pre-image of f of x. By definition, the pre-image of f of x is all of the elements of the domain that map to f of x under the function f. Well, we know that x is one of those inputs because if we take x and we apply the function f, the result that we get is f of x. So x is going to be in the pre-image of f of x. But we know that this pre-image has only one element for each output. So x is going to be the unique element of this pre-image. And that means that when we take f inverse, when we get that element out of the pre-image set, the result is just going to be x. So f inverse of f of x equals x. And now we have that f inverse is a right inverse and a left inverse. So it's a two-sided inverse to our function f. So that is why bijective functions have a two-sided inverse. If a function is bijective, then for each element of the codomain, the pre-image has exactly one element. So we can define an inverse function by just taking the one element of the pre-image for each output. And by the definition of pre-image, we can show that that gives us both a left and a right inverse. Thank you.